Hello and welcome to Our People Speak, our online program that talks about our traditional native activities in our communities in Interior Alaska. I'm Sharon McConnell, Executive Director of Danakanaga. I'm very fortunate to have two esteemed leaders with us today to talk about protocols, native protocols, and how that helps shape our communities and the lives of the native people that live here in this region. We have with us esteemed Elder Miranda Wright, native leader, thank you for being with us. And also our second traditional chief of the region, Andy Jimmy. Thank you for being here, Andy. So as I mentioned, you know, for um, many, many generations, the native people of interior Alaska have relied on their values and their protocols uh, to carry out their native way of life. And on the program today, we're gonna to talk about some of the protocols um, that have been changing through the years uh, and uh, just talk a little bit about uh, each of them. But first of all, I guess, Miranda, if you wanna start us off, when we say protocols in the native community, what comes to your mind? Procedures, traditional procedures or um, behavioral mode, the, the way we behave. The, mm -hmm. the moral code, I guess, is one of the words I'm searching for. Mm -hmm. And Andy, what about you? What do you, <clears throat> what do you think about when somebody says native protocols? It's to uh, let's see. do things like a plan, plan session or uh, trying to keep up with the tradition, how how it was done before, and if there's any changes or uh, what changes and co to correct them, and it's to kind of pave the way for the younger, so the younger people will understand. That's me. Now you both are from different tribes. You're from Nalato and you're from Minto. I know uh, some people that are watching this may not realize that each tribe has their own protocols, how they conduct them and uh, what the meaning is behind them. Uh, I'm just wondering, when you were growing up, both of you, what do you remember about protocols or was it just subtle in that you observed what was going on, Miranda? You know, even though there's uh, many different tribes in our area, the basic protocols and belief systems that we have, I think is all basically the same. The way we practice them, that's what may vary a little bit. Okay. But you know, one of the things that I think was always important is respect, respect for, respect for yourself as a woman and knowing your boundaries as a woman, respect for the men and their boundaries. And a lot of that was to keep, um, balance in the way our life moved around because everything uh, is interconnected. You know, everything has life and your activity over here could change something over here. So you needed to be aware of what you were doing, what you were saying, and having respect for all the life, no matter if it was a rock or a twig or an animal or another person. So those were the, the things that um, you just grow up with it. You're, 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 it's from the time that you're very small, you understand those things. Uh, one of the big things as a woman that we had to respect, or as, as even girls, is we couldn't step into our dad's shoes. He was the provider for the family. He was the one that took care of, of the food and our survival. We took care of the home. And a lot of people would say, oh, well, we don't believe in that women's, you know, women's rights, we can do anything. But it wasn't just that, that we were our weaker sex or anything. It was that we needed to keep harmony and keep everything in balance. So it's, those are some of the more important things that I remember. I mean, there's just, there's a, just a ton of, of other protocols that you were raised with, you know, like you never refuse food, no matter what it is. When someone offers you food, you eat. 
you know, things like that. Do you <laughs> see a change in the protocols? Because you just mentioned, you know, some of the comments that people say, oh, you know, women and men are equal and, you know, that sort Definitely of thing. Definitely there's been a lot of change, especially with Western education and our exposure to the outside world, outside of our environment. You know, we uh, learn about women's rights and, you know, all these types of things. So, yeah, there's a big change. Um, when Christianity came in also, you know, that changed a lot because they didn't understand our belief systems, how important our belief systems were, and tend to put that down as a negative thing. So, you know, there's always those um, challenges that our people face today is, which way am I supposed to go and which is the true path? So, mm -hmm. And Chief Jimmy, um, if I may, you're 88 years old now. What do you recall when you were a young man uh, in the village about protocols? What did you observe? <coughs> well, on a men's side, it's a lot of protocols, a lot of advice like as to how to survive, how to treat animals, how to respect animals. It's uh, survival. And in my household, that's what I, we, we didn't go to too many meetings where they had, where they gather the kids. They, I don't know why. I think mostly because small, not enough room, and so I got to listen to some of the elders giving advice how to do things, like the protocol, how to. Kind of, I don't think there was too much difference between men and women. The women teach the young girls how to do things, but uh, what I heard was the women support the men. And that's the way we went. There was no argument on who's the boss or <clears throat> but uh, like the men yet mostly the boys when I was growing up is how to treat other people, how to treat elders. Like when we my dad was a hunter. When nobody can get moose they go to him and catch moose like in January, February is rough Times. And we barely get, after he catches the moose, we barely get enough for a meal because the elders, everybody get, get a little piece of it. The elders first, of course, the best part. That's, that's what I learned when I give. You give an elder something, something to eat, don't just give him any parts. Give them the best part of the. That's what I always, my grandkids know is doing that. And get it ready for them so he can just throw it in a pot, you know. You don't just throw it here. <laughs> and it's mostly on that, what the boys learn. And I, should have known no more being old, but I was, when I came back from boarding school, it was the time of change. The people were changing from the old way to the Westerners. So they were telling us, you have to forget some of the, it wasn't the old people who were saying that, it was the new elders at that time. 51 B, uh, like my dad and the people his age were saying, 
we got to hang on to our tradition. But the younger elders were saying, you got to you got to learn how to make money and forget the old way. Mm -hmm. It was quite a challenge there. It was, uh, you don't know which way to go. I, but I hung on to it because I wanted to trap when I was a kid. I wanted to be like my dad. And so after boarding school, I went trapping and fishing and stuff. Uh, subsistence life. I worked on a, worked in summertime, but trapped all winter. So I was wishing my grandma would live a little longer, but she she taught me a lot of uh, the old old ways. You see, when she was gone, it was different than when her daughter, oldest daughter, my mom. It changed a little bit there, and then on down mm -hmm. the line. So the, I think the younger people like me was doing more what they want to do instead of listen to the protocol of the older people. Mm -hmm. You know, we, um, we've had shows on our native values. We've talked about those. Can you explain to those listening to the show, how do values and protocols go hand in hand? Or what is the big difference between when we talk about values versus protocols? Miranda? You know, I was talking about respect earlier. And to me, that's one of the primary values, if you will, that we have as people. I just want to give you an example of, of uh, some of the things that I'm, I'm referring to. A long time ago, you know, before we had machines and all of this stuff in our life, we used to travel by dog sleds, and we had to camp because it would take us a while to get from point A to point B. Early in the morning, especially if we had fresh snow, early in the morning, Dad or the men in the party would take off on snowshoes, and they would leave the women and children in the camp to break camp and load the sleds up and get the dogs hooked up. And and when I was growing up, I used to hear young men laugh about that, say, oh, yeah, you know, we'd leave all the work to the women and we'd just take off. That really wasn't the idea. The whole idea was you couldn't run a dog team over fresh snow with no trail. So the men would leave early. It was still dark. And they'd walk on snowshoes. And the mo mother would feed the children break the camp, load up the dog sled. So several hours would pass from the time that the men had left. The trail would set up for them. So when they left with the dog team, they had a harder trail to travel across. When they got to the next point, the husband was there. He already had a campfire going for them. You know, that type of balance and working together, where you, know, you, you worked in harmony with one another, and the respect that you had for one another and accepting those roles. To me, uh, that's what we're talking about. And to me, that, that story just illustrates whether it's anything that you're doing. You know, that the man does, you know, the woman does a lot of work keeping, you know, the hides tanned and the food prepared and preserved. Um, I was just sharing with someone else uh, yesterday, I was at a little uh, uh, Christmas gathering and. They had a, a container of hard candy. And I said, oh, the grandmas would just love this. And I always remember my grandmother telling me, always put a little away in the cash. Because in the springtime, we'll be out of sugar. You take one of those hard candies and you put it in your tea. You know, little things like that that, that go on, you know, that, the consideration that you have for other people in your life and how you balance all of that. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of protocols. I think one of the big ones that a lot, there's been a lot of discussion around in the recent years is chief's necklaces. Um, I know Danakanaga worked with uh, TCC and Doyon and uh, FNA on uh, talking about what is the proper pro protocol for chief's necklaces because unfortunately, 
in recent years, like in the last 10 years, we've seen people sell them, just sell them uh, without any thought of why these are made and why are they given out. Um, what, is, what do you recall about Chiefs necklaces, Chief Jimmy? Well, when I was <clears throat> growing up, I, there weren't too many of them. They weren't making them like they are now. I don't know where they come from, but I seen some that's really, really old, and it's all the elders when I had when I was growing up. The elders, is, I'm talking not my dad's age, but older. Like his dad said, there was quite a, there was a lot of them in old mental, a lot of elders. Every one of them had beads, uh, the necklace, and they, every kind of event, every gathering, they would put on there. And not only the chief, it's every elder that had one. Of course, at one time, probably they were all chiefs of their clan or, you know. And they never really talked about it, but uh, there was other discussions from other people that... What I heard was if, if an elder got the beads, like I discussed it a little bit at Huslia last year. When I became, was voted in second chief, second tradition chief, the chief, like TCC, or it could have been past chief, placed a necklace on you, and he's saying, Doing that, he's saying, you earned it. You wear this at meetings and everything, but you earned it. So that was a big thing when I was uh, growing up. I heard many elders saying, you earn it. When somebody placed it on you, you earned it. And... Uh, it's a little different, like I said before, I, my daughters make them, so I, I put it on. It's, and it's okay, it's nothing wrong with it. It's this that it make really a difference when somebody plays it on you. And you see a lot of that now, so. But that was... It wasn't saying that any certain people owned, because it was easy at that time in the early 50s, 40s, 50s, because everyone that had one earned it, and they passed it on to who they think should have it. Someone say they just give it to their oldest son, but I seen other people give it to, you know, say you earned it, you have no relation. Do you have any comment about chief necklaces? Well, you know, where I come from in the Nolato area, we didn't wear chief necklaces, um, but we had chief jackets, moose skin jackets, and then Taylor was sometimes put down the length of the sleeves uh, sometimes on their uh, moosekin pants along the outside edges, or um, sometimes they had a, a pouch, ammunition pouch. But mainly in those earlier days from you know, the stories I've gathered from some of the elders was the people that were traders that went you know, different, through different tribes and areas would bring back that dentalia because dentalia 
in the early, early days was used as a form of monetary exchange among our people. So a person who had dentalia was considered to be a well-off person. And we didn't, um, we didn't look at wealth in that sense um, because we were humble people. You know, and everybody, we treated everyone equal. You didn't elevate one, you know, and the, the chief status is something that came in, again, with Western culture, where the, you know, who's your elected boss, or, you know. We had um, different categories, like Andy mentioned his dad was a hunter. And so we had, you know, people that were the hunters and the providers. We had people who were the singers and the song composers. We had people who were the culture bearers, you know, some that were the food providers and some that were the, the good seamstresses. We had different people that had their own specialties. And we had the traders and you know a lot of times they could speak several of the different dialects and some could even speak, uh, communicate with the people on the coast and they would trade over that way. So you know there was all those types of dynamics going on. So the notion of the chief's necklace and chief's coat, you know, it's kind of a relatively new concept. And again, when you're talking about the changes in our protocol, this is one of those evolutions that you see happening. In the early stories, when we're talking about our clan systems, it talks about how the Martin man came to represent the middle of the stream or the water clan, and he was wearing a dentalia shells. They didn't refer to it as necklaces, or he was carrying dentalia shells because it comes from the, the water. Mm -hmm. you know, so there's all of those different things that go on. And um, I just find it very interesting. You know, and it's, uh, it's something that's become very acceptable today. Um, everybody looks at it. And like Andy said, you know, when, when you're gifted a necklace and it's given to you and placed around your neck, um, is really symbolic and very powerful. When I was on the Doyon board and I received a a necklace twice mm -hmm. and it was placed around my neck. I mean, it's it's very moving, you know. And it's a uh, yeah, it's like I said, one of those changing things, and I think very popular today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, there's so many different protocols. Did you have something else? Yeah, Chief? I just want to what you said about that pouch. Well, we have one like that with a knife case. Mm -hmm beaded knife case. That, i only seen the chiefs wear that. Uh, it's uh, at my age. Of course, uh, there wasn't too many of them around, but uh, the chiefs, like Chief Ninana, Tolvana, Minto, in that area, they, they, only the chiefs had that. At, uh, knife case on them. Because they earned it. They earned it. Mm -hmm. So, and I know we could go to a whole show on the chief's necklaces, uh, uh, but I want to go over a few more protocols. Uh, I know there's been a lot of interest uh, or a lot of, uh, not confusion, but a lot of interest on potlatches. Because I know different tribes have different protocols for potlatches. Uh, like from Minto, where you're from, Chief, what are some of the big protocols when you um, hold a potlatch? Well, the big one is uh, the big one is memorial potlatch. It's not a funeral potlatch; it's memorialist. They 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 plan it for years two, three, four years, and I want to have a big, that the purpose of that is they're telling their loved ones, it's the last thing I'm going to do for you. It's, this is it. I'm going to forget and go on living or go, because they, the tough times a long time ago, it was hard to lose. They lost a lot of young people you know, during the flu and 
uh, just a hardship, you know, and a tough winter, and it really was, they mourned for a long time, and that was supposed to be the end of the morning, and that's Memorial Potlet. That's a big one. They, they feed everybody for three, four days, and they give at the end. Give. It's a little different now, but my mom told me one time she seen the family. After they made that potluck, they didn't even have a pot to cook in. They just gave everything away. Wow. To start all over again. So that's how important it was to them. Of course, you got funeral potlets. I have a big one. There, right now, it changed a little bit. They give a little bit at the end, but when I was growing up, they didn't do that in our area. And it was just feed everybody because a lot of them made memorial potlets. And that's when they give. And so it, that didn't happen in our area till the 70s. So we don't, some people don't do it, but it's not a mental tradition. And, but they do it just to, I guess, want, want to. Mm-hmm. But, uh, and then they, they have, uh, Sometimes they just make potlatch. I did one to have just to get the people together. It was a really tough winter, and uh, I was young enough to go out and get a couple of moose and make potlatch just to get people together. And sometimes they do that. But uh, other than that, that's. Right now they have potlets honoring somebody, like they did when I got elected second chief. That was good. They start doing that. I think they had that before, and that's ours. Mm-hmm. When you hold the pot latches, is, do you have, according to your protocol in your community or your village, is it only men who can serve the food? And is there a direction where they go, follow? Uh, who cooks the food? Are there any protocols like, like that you can tell us about? I heard some, but I never heard it from the elders. Uh, it's different because uh, we just had the meat and fish and not a whole bunch of salads like they do now. And the biscuits, stuff i seen kids serve it. I used to, they used to say, like if my dad make potlatch, I help him. It's a family thing. Okay. When you make potlatch just to get together, the families right there. The, fun- the funeral potlets, the families there. Those are the ones that are supposed to do the work. Be- and the other people just volunteer. Uh, they always told us in the funeral potlet, if your relative passed away, and if you just sit there and watch everybody work, that's the way you're going to be for the rest of your life. You wouldn't amount to anything. That's what they used to tell us. Now that little change, everybody's doing the work honoring the people that lost one, I think. But uh, the mental way was you do the work and the people just kind of help you along. And same thing with the memorial potlatch. There, it's a little different. The memorial potlatch, the the family do all the serving. 
like if I make a memorial potlatch, which I did for my mother-in-law and my daughter, our family did everything. Mm -hmm. They served. And if there's other people, they sometimes there's two or three other people making the memorial potlatch at the same time. <clears throat> same time. So they, their family do the serving. And they have one, one server that served the important people. One, like I guess my family make pot, memorial potlatch. Now I would be the one that give the elders the best part of the, I mean, mm -hmm. it's usually the oldest one, but uh, so that's the way it is. It's, I never heard where, I heard up here when they make potlatch here, the women don't serve, but uh, I don't remember women serving, but I don't never heard that they couldn't. You know, I I know this. I know in the memorial potlatch, the whole family's out there, mm -hmm. the men and women, kids. So we all help each other. So I I never heard where they say women not supposed to serve. Mm -hmm. What what about you, Miranda, from your area by in the lotto? You know, t really things have as Andy is talking. I'm thinking, boy, things really have changed since our youth. Um, the men also served at our potlatches. Um, our our potlatches in the Lotto area have dramatically changed from when I was young. I can remember the men coming in with the big tubs of soup and serving, and we didn't have like Andy mentioned, salads and all of these side, you know, we had basic meat, soup, fish. We didn't have pans of baked fish. We had dried fish, you know, and they used to have the big, long dried fish. And that would be saved until after everybody had the soup and the, the meat, and then they would pass the fish around to people as they were assembled. There would be um, pilot bread, and maybe boxes of cookies from the store, canned fruit. But I can remember the men opening the cans and setting the can out on the potlatch table. You know, things like that. The women um, served their fish ice cream. And like Andy pointed out, there are certain people, you know, the, the honored guests and your elders, that they would serve to first. And berries also. They'd have frozen berries that they would uh, pass around to the to the people. And we didn't have, like I said, all this extra stuff. But if there was bread, um, usually the women would bake bread and they would slice it up and that would be set out on the on the table where people would gather around to eat. And we sat on the floor. We didn't sit around tables. We had a cloth laid out in the middle of the hall and people would assemble around that. And so, you know, things just have changed dramatically, but I can remember Everybody brought a little something. Even though we had families that were hosting the potlatch, nobody came in empty-handed. Everybody brought a little something. I can remember the old um, grandpas that were widowed coming in with a box of cookies or a box of pilot bread You know that they would contribute to the potlatch. But it was the uh, family that was hosting the potlatch that generally got the, the game for the potlatch, and you know, just uh, when we had the memorial, or pardon me, the funeral potlatch, we never had any gift giving. And generally, when we lose a loved one, it's supposed to be the opposite family who does all the preparations during that time of loss. And uh, young people today often get confused when we say the opposite family. Because in those early times, they referred to your opposite clan. So like I'm of the water clan, the water clan people couldn't take care of the funeral preparations. It had to be from the caribou clan or the Nalcine clan that would take care of that. And then the, our family, the water clan family, would then 
make the potlatch to thank those people who helped put your loved ones away. And we didn't have gift giving at that funeral potlatch. Mm -hmm. And then, as Andy also mentioned, you know, we'd wait a few years and then we'd have the memorial potlatch. And generally there's um, several families that go together for the memorial potlatch because it's, it's a big thing we have in our area, we call it the stick dance. And it's a week long event and we feed the people every night. So we look at all of the families that are participating and we assign one night to different families to do all the preparations. And if the family is small, you know, you could combine two or three families together to do the serving. And that includes preparing the hall, making sure there's water and wood, whatever you need, uh, cleaning up afterwards, all of those types of details in addition to providing the food and, and preparation of the food and all of that. So, you know, there's, uh, there are similarities, but yet there's a few little differences. Today, um, we don't see that same protocol. We don't have, you know, we don't use the big pots like they still do around Minto and up this way of where the men are cooking the soup. Now everybody prepares them at home and bring in individual pots of food. Mm -hmm. So continuing talking about food protocols in our native communities, um, could both of you talk a little bit about um, when somebody gets their first moose or their first fish and uh, what do they do when that happens and uh, why is that important? Andy? Yeah, we, from the old people, we still do it a little bit in mental families. But uh, if, like when we were uh, I was, I don't know, six, seven years old, I shot my first duck. And we was out in the camp, and out there, there are camps all over Minto Flats, and there was, I think, two or three uh, two or three camps not too far away, three or four. But I shot my first duck, and then my dad would got a bunch of geese and stuff. Then he went out again the next day and got some more. And about the third or fourth hunt, he cooked. He, I didn't know what was going on. And he invited all the camps that's not too far away. And they came and had a big potlets for honoring me for my first first kill. And it went down old Mento, they were still doing it. And then we moved to new Mento, 70, 1970, it kind of died. And then when my grandkid, my great grand, I, when my son shot moose, I did the small one. This, and there wasn't too many people there. But now they, about three, four years ago, they had a big one. All the family that, that fall, their son or daughter shot moose, I think, Sometime in January, they all got together, the families, and had a big one for all. I think there were six of them. And that's the old way. That's, uh, they always honor the kids that shot their first animal. So it's what's this? It's slowing Pardon down, me. but it's slowing down, but it's, for some families, just to live. Good. So, can you explain to those that are watching what is the significance of celebrating a child's first kill? What is what does it mean? Well, it means that you did great. Keep on going. I guess it's just uh, 
Yeah, it, what they, I had to talk to, I mean, I had to go to an elder during that celebration. I went to the elder and then he told me one of the greatest kill he ever had or, you know, when there was nothing to eat, he went out for miles and miles and shot moose and brought us back. He tells you story, he tells you a su successful story about hunting. And, and then uh, that, uh, I think that it don't come from families. Some other person would, uh, away from the family, does the talking. Because when my grandkids shot the first moose, somebody else talked to them. You got to tell them some kind of encouraging story, I guess. Mm -hmm. That's the purpose. Mm -hmm. What about in your region? You know, one of the first things that we celebrate for young, especially young boys, if they catch a weasel, you know, weasels are really fast. They dart around fast. So if you catch a weasel, that young lad that catches that weasel is identified as a potential provider for that community. He's got good skill if he can catch something that moves that fast. And he's honored with just a little, you know, maybe the family will make a special meal for him. But that's recognized. They'll bring in a, a grandpa from the community. It's just a small small party, but you watch that man and the elders start talking to him and they start guiding him, you know, just through, like he said, stories of encouragement. And then when they catch, and we don't use the K word when we're talking about our animals mm -hmm. and we don't use the word, the animal's name either for the big animals. We are going to go out and look around or, you know, we're going to go for a ride. Um, so if they are successful, then they talk about he was lucky. And luck may not have the whole Western connotation. It just, you know that he was successful in his hunt. But uh, you don't say he no. killed an animal. <clears throat> you, don't, you don't have disrespect for the animal in that sense. And so when they do get their first animal that can provide for the community, then they have we call it a tea, because it's generally held in your home, and you invite the elders in the community to come in, as Andy said, to uh, give stories, you know, share their experiences. And it also teaches the young man to listen, and to listen to those experiences. In the early days, travel, you know, we didn't have cell phones and GPS and all of this stuff. So you had to be aware of the conditions. If there was thin ice or if there was floating moss in the lake, you know, different things that they're telling in the story and makes that young man aware of the environment when he's going out there. So there's you know, a lot of those guiding principles that are embedded in those stories and you have to be able to understand how to listen. And it's almost like a rite of passage for a young man um, we held a, a small potlatch for both my grandson and my great-grandson when they went through this experience. And, you know, my great-grandson was 12 or 13, and uh, he was referred to as a young man now. You're a provider now for the family. And we, you know, he, he was given some gifts also to help his uh, his hunting pack, you know, fill up his hunting pack with essential items. And when it was all over, he looked at me and he said, Grandma, I didn't know what it was all about. When we told him that there was going to be a tea for him, he said, I'm a man. You know, it was like, <laughs> you know, the importance of becoming a provider is embedded in them. And, you know, it's... Um, like a young boy said, oh, I don't want to do, you know, I don't want to do that. And all of a sudden they realize the importance of doing something and being set on that, on that path again. 
Huh? So yeah, very important. And again, giving, giving your catch to somebody older or to the community. In my great grandson's case, there was a potlatch in the community adjacent to where he, he went out. And so he gave the head to them for their, their soup for the potlatch. And he gave most of that, his catch to one of his older uncles. Mm -hmm. Wow. Even I'm learning a lot <laughs> listening yeah. to both of you. Uh, we could go on all day about different protocols. I mean, as you said, we're evolving as a Native community and Native people. Um, you know, some people always think when they think about uh, Indigenous people, they it's kind of like stagnant, but it's not. We're evolving, you know throughout the years. Um, one other protocol that has a lot of interest by people is our native songs and dances. Um, who is allowed to write those songs and who can perform them? I know in your area, you use uh, scarves and why is that? So Miranda, could you talk a little bit and then we'll talk with Andy about that. That's, a, that's an evolution the, the scarves are more modern day uh, type of thing. We never used scarves way back in the day, but the women generally had long hair and they would hold their hair and dance with their hair in their hand. And I think that's where the scarves kind of came in. Either that or uh, oftentimes they would use um, the wing feathers off the eagle. They would hold those and dance with those. In some cases, people will use gloves, or you know, in other words, there was always something in your hand, mm -hmm. and so it, the, the scarf just became because of the. Um, I wish I could remember how to say it in our language, when um, we're dancing, the way we move our hands. In English, they refer to it as the washtub dance, because it's like you're you're scrubbing on a washboard, mm -hmm. but. Uh, in, in our language, it means your, your hand movements. Because when you're doing your sad songs, you're dancing with your hands and your head downward. And when you're doing your happy songs, then you raise your hands up this way and your eyes are also elevated. You know, so there's those types of things that are changing through time. So who can write those songs? Or who traditionally does write the songs? Um, you know, it could be anybody who has that gift. Um, like I mentioned earlier, a lot of times we have providers, we have composers, we have singers, this, and there are some people who are just gifted like that. And if they want to compose a song for a loved one or their friend or their friend's child, you know, they can do that. Sometimes people will request, will go to them and request that they compose a song for them. Um, as far as singing, when a new song is created, it's introduced at the beginning of our memorial potlatch. We have singing every night, and those, those new songs are, are introduced on that first night. And by the end of the week, the, most of the members of the community that can sing are singing along with that composer. They're learning that song throughout that week. So the whole community gets to sing it. But when you're singing it, it has to be, the composer is identified. Who it was made for or composed for is usually identified if, if that's known, and the community that the composer is from. So it's like if you're writing a, a scholastic paper and you have to have your references in the back for all the, mm -hmm. it's basically that same concept, but this is an oral form of that. Mm. And what about from the Minto area, Chief? Who traditionally writes the songs there? Well, I'll start with the memorial. Like I make a potlatch for my daughter. There wasn't too many elders left at that time, so I I asked the one that's saying them. Everybody know her, Evelyn Alexander. She was still alive. She uh, made a lot of songs, and but I told her what I wanted wanted to be in there, 
in the song. Like happy, she was a happy girl. She was a good worker and things like that. You tell them what you want in the song, and they'll put it in there. And that's memorial, memorial songs. They put what you want in there. And then uh, the other songs, just whoever, like. If I was good at writing songs, I, I'll make one for my mom and dad, or a different deal. And my dad's, like Miranda said, she, they're gifted, you know. They're gifted in ways. And I, my dad, he's a dancer. He was a lead, lead dancer and mental, mental dancers. And he made a lot of dancing songs, the fast ones, a lot of them. Uh, like you hear the twist song and traveling songs and all that. And I say that it's gifted because I remember when he made that uh, Twist song. In the morning, I was getting ready for school, and the radio was on, and Chubby Checker was saying in twist song. I guess it's a new, new kind of dance. He listened to it, and he, while we was eating breakfast, he, we was talking. He say, "Wait." We was quiet, and then he hummed a little bit. And then he, I told the story before, how fast, when you say gifted, that means that he just hummed it a couple of times and then my mom jumped in and and the song was made, just at breakfast. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that's the way I heard a lot of other songs, it just came to them, but uh, like the memorial songs, you have to work on it. It's a little different. So I heard, and if you could let the audience and myself know, I heard when sometimes songs are performed and then you can't perform them again or you can only perform them at a certain time. Is that correct? That's the memorial song. Oh, okay. That's the memorial song. That's when, remember when I say when you make a memorial pot. You quit everything. You drop. You're you're supposed to uh, quit mourning, and it'll never be brought up again. And the song the same way. Oh, okay. All right. Same for your region. With our stick dance uh, uh, memorial services, we have what we call our thirteen sacred songs. There used to be like maybe twenty six at one point that are are sung specifically at that potlatch. And it's usually on Friday night before they bring in the stick that we dance around. And that's the only time they're sung. Okay. The people that are going to be singing will take the week prior to that and they'll practice, but that's the only time they can sing them is they can practice that week just before the ceremony is held. And then, and it's really frowned upon if somebody, especially like young people that don't understand the protocol uh, will be humming them or singing them, and people will say, "Have plan a, you know, don't sing that song." It's okay. Uh, are there any other protocols that come up in um, your mind as we're talking about them today that we haven't covered? One thing I wanted to mention, though, and Andy was talking about, you know, the other songs that are composed. Because uh, where I'm from, we have mainly memorial type songs. You know, the songs that are made in memory of a person, we can sing those at a gathering, but we never had what the people around home refer to as tourist songs. Uh, the only song that I know of that was, well, there's two, um, was Eagle Island Blues mm -hmm. that was made by um, my grandma's late husband, Tom Patsy. And my grandma was, was gone by then, but they were stuck at, at camp 
during the winter because of a, a big snowfall, and he was wanted to go back to the village for the Christmas celebrations. And there was a man in the town that played the violin. You know, he could make in the song Tom is saying he could make that violin talk and cry. You know, he was such a good violin player. And so that's one song that you know is one of those. And then there was another one called Gallon de Ole, uh, when they used to make moonshine, and they'd carry their their jugs, and that's what that song is about. But other than those, and there might be one or two others that I'm missing, but um, people were who made those types of songs were frowned upon. Um, it was the way I heard it explained by an elder was it's like you're laughing at the world around you when you're just making fun songs for nothing, especially if you're walking down a trail and singing loud, you know, that that was not acceptable protocol, you know, when you're disturbing the environment around you. So, you know, uh -huh. that was something that's changed dramatically in today's <laughs> world. <laughs> this is this has been so interesting. Um, well, how do we carry on these protocols? I mean, you both said things have been changing throughout the years. How do we get our younger generation uh, to keep these protocols going? Uh, because it does play a valuable part in our native communities. Um, it's as basically the foundation, you know, of how we carry out our traditional activities and be a native people. What would you say, how do we get the kids involved, Andy? Well, all we can do is talk to them. I, <clears throat> when my dad and mom was dancing, they used to travel all over. And even the dance songs, they never used drums. Me and Anna never used drums. Tana, no. I don't think. And it changed after it started down the highway, I think, someplace. It, but my dad was still still living when they moved over to the old, the new village. And someone brought a drum in, and he said, "No, we're not going to use it." But as soon as he passed away, they used it. Yeah. <laughs> so that's one one thing that uh, I'm not against drum. It's, it's just that we never used to use it, that's all. And that's our traditional way. And it must have meant something to him because he, when somebody brought drum into their dance, he said, not while I'm around. And then another thing is he made, we're talking about the twist song. They changed it. If, uh, And I don't think that they should anybody should change any song. I mean they didn't they just change it, they start the regular you know, the regular way, the speed, then they go faster and faster and faster. And it kinda bothered me because that's my dad's song. My dad wrote it or made it, or, and then they change it. How would he feel? Mm -hmm. It's okay with me. But it's, it's just that I think the old way is once the song is made, or once any kind of traditional activity, any kind, once the elders started, it should not be changed. It should be the same way, like memorial potlatch or any kind of potlatch or any kind of activities that's traditional. And everybody got their own traditional way to do things. But keep, keep it there. Keep it the way it started. And that's hard to do maybe, but that's my Miranda? Before I touch on your question, I wanted to touch on Andy's comments, because I, I totally agree with him, because many of the songs that are composed are um, 
like intercessions when our loved one is going to the, to the next world. They're almost like a, what people today refer to as a prayer. You're talking about the good qualities of that person, and it's a song about that individual. And when you change it, you know, and I think part of the change is happening because a lot of our younger generation don't speak the language. They don't understand. They could sing the songs, but maybe they don't understand what the words are saying in that song. And I think it's very important to remember that. Um, as far as teaching our young people, um, you know, that's a really a tough question. We've tried doing it in the schools, and there's some success in that. But I think things like this really help. You know, our younger generation are all into electronics. And there was a time when our elders said, you know, don't put it in books and don't do this and do that. But the way our young people learn today, I think we have to be aware of that and be able to reach them in a method that they can understand. But also, we mustn't forget that teaching at home is still so important. And kids learn by example. So it's, I think, important for us to, to hold on to everything that we know and share it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you both so much for being on the program. Uh, well, we really enjoyed talking about protocols, or I have. I know I've learned a lot of things just listening to you two. Uh, I just want to thank Miranda Wright, one of our native leaders from Interior Alaska, our second traditional chief of the region, Andy Jimmy. Thank you so much. And thank you for watching. I'm Sharon McConnell. Thank you.